When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass-fed and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code ETM to choose your free offer and get $20 off. This past week has been a time of reflection for me and probably you as well. I've been thinking a lot about racism and the actions I've taken, even some that I haven't taken towards the injustice. And I just can't believe we're still at this place. Although I've never faced racism myself, I've seen it firsthand with so many friends and I've definitely seen how race shows up when we talk about money. I had a chance to sit down with my friend Brian B.T. Terrell from Bro Capital to talk about racism in an honest way. The differences between what he says a neighborhood and a community, the injustices in the financial industry, and BT's work with Bro Capital, which is the first fintech company advancing the financial health of Black millennials, was something called social banking. This is definitely a timely episode that I hope you enjoy. You're listening to Millennial Money with award winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Compton Game where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. We've all spent more time with family lately. It can feel like old times, but your mind is on the future too, and what you can do to shape it. At Sandy Spring Bank, we work with clients to help them grow and protect their money with wealth management, trust services, and insurance, so they can enjoy today and ultimately pass along their wealth. We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your dreams. Visit sandyspringbank.com slash wealth. Wealth and insurance products are not FDIC insured, not guaranteed, and may lose value. I believe that these are the types of conversations we need to be having, and I am committed to do a lot more of these conversations around race and money. It's my personal passion to do what I can to change financial literacy in this country and around the world, and Roz and Brian share my passion. Regardless of race, religion, beliefs, income, status, you name it, 
I believe that everyone should have the same access to not only learning about money, but the same tools, tips, products, you name it, to really create a life well-lived. So let's have this conversation. Well, BT, I am so excited to chat with you today. I know that we're talking about a topic that is uh, not everybody's most fun topic to talk about, but I think this is a really important message. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, your business partner, Roz, has been on the show before, and I was talking to him, and you know, with everything that's going on in the world right now, uh, again, I think this is a really important conversation. I can only see the world through my eyes. Obviously, I'm a white female, and I've experienced a level of sexism in my career, but I've never really myself walked through racism. So I just wanted to start out, BT, tell me a little bit about where racism shows up for you in everyday life. I I really want to understand what it's like to walk in your shoes as best as I possibly can. The first thing about racism is that um, I'm one to not even look at the word and just say, you know what, this is one person against another person. To me, it's, it's systematic. Um, it's institutional. Right. And um, it's, it's actually um, affecting the masses in terms of, you know, my folks are from Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas, Kansas, out of all states. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I can hear stories from my grandparents talking about how the Klan burned down their church in Shelford, Arkansas. One of my grandfathers was uh, chased down by the Klan in a pickup truck, similar to um, Ahmaud Arbery yeah. in the great state of Georgia. He was chased down in this little town called... Um, Cairo, Illinois, it's on the border of Missouri, really not too far from Arkansas, where the majority of my family still resides. And to me, it's institutional because of, you know, you can even look at the 13th Amendment. And if you really dissect it, it says that slavery is abolished except for, (laughs) except for imprisonment. Right. Um, so that's that's one step where it's blatantly said. But then you could look at how the banks um, get involved in this concept. Mm. Um, I'm one to look at racism and go a little bit further and say, well, if we call it racism, you also got to look at the other term that isn't really discussed too much on the large media outlets. And I call that systematic white supremacy. Again, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the institution. I'm not saying that, you know, this white person is saying this to me on a daily basis. Um, even though I, I live down the street from neighbors that will wave the Confederate battle flag. Um, oh, wow. And, you know, say good morning to me. <laughs> So, but to me, you know, it's an institution because it's five levels to this. And the first one is financial economics. Yes. The second level is the political spectrum. The third is justice. Mm. The fourth is is the media and the fifth is education and I strongly believe that if you take it out of that order then you'll be lost you know for instance you have uh, protests going on and I'm all for protesting however I'm not going to be out there I've told my parents you ain't gonna catch me out there protesting because It's time out for that. Um, It's two things that I truly believe that the institution of racism respects and everything else is second tier. Number one, 
It's financial economics. You got to hit them where it hurts. So Number. how do you do that? Sure. So the way you do that is you have to look at what's being said in, in the media. If we want to jump there for a second, you'll have a mayor such as Keisha Lance Bottoms in the city of Atlanta. You'll have um, the mayor of Chicago, uh, Lori Lightfoot, and so on, uh, saying you're destroying your communities if we want to take it back to the protests. Um, because, of course, these protests really finally hit what I call a boiling point. Well, it was like, man, we in the age of all these cameras, we yeah. see it in real life. And that's what my grandparents keep saying. This is nothing new. It's just now visualized for people that wow. wanted to sweep it under the rug. So the circling back to the, the question you asked is that you hear a lot of folks say you're destroying our communities. And I always say, what community? These are neighborhoods. Right. <laughs> And, right, for, yeah. and for some people, we didn't we didn't took out the word neighbor and it's just the hood. Um, so in talking to Bro Capital, uh, me as having the honor of being the CFO and you know, having my experience uh, at Morehouse, political science background, worked on numerous campaigns, um, worked in the White House worked for a congressman, um, went and got my master's in public policy from DePaul University, went and got my master's of science and finance from the University of Miami. I had to deconstruct what I learned. And I said, it's not a neighborhood. See, that you're saying it's a community. Let me break down what community means. A community you own and control your resources. For instance, right. going back to that, that five-point list I gave you, commercial banks, credit unions. Um, I'll even throw in something that Ross wanted to touch on. Banking with CVLI. It's called cash value life insurance. I know you have an insurance background. Yes, very familiar. Okay, okay. These are the forms of financial economics um, that you must own and control to be first considered the stepping stone of a community. Number two, government officials. This is going back to political. We're talking about um, folks that, that are in this, this situation, as I would say, growing up on the south side of Chicago, when things went wrong, we looked at government officials to give us answers. And for a lot of them, they were just being sold to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. When it comes yeah. to uh, going a little bit further than that, I'm talking about the court system, the judicial system, police, firefighters, justice and public safety. Um, Sometimes there's a delay in a response when things go wrong in the neighborhood because it's still not a community of, of, of black folks when we're talking about racism. When it comes to the media, I'm talking about publication platforms. Uh, what is being pushed on a daily basis? I always say you turn the news, they usually don't talk about what Lakeisha and Jamal did in school, how they made the dean's list, uh, how they just got an internship with a venture capital firm. It's usually about the same old Tad story. And that's another push of institutional racism without necessarily calling it what it is. So it's like whatever, whatever you're shining the spotlight on, that's what people are believing or seeing or whatever it may be. And they're not seeing the other side of things, the success stories, the progress. They're not Correct. seeing that because it's just not the spotlight's not on that. Right. It's, it's really not sexy to talk about. People want to <laughs> get them. They want to constantly listen to mess things that, that may keep them up at night, things they could talk about 
amongst yes. friends and family members. Um, and that, that final piece to make it a community going back to education. If you don't own and control the school board, city of Chicago is a case study. No elected school board members for Chicago Public School District. That's a problem. The mayor is the only one that can appoint. Right. Yeah. The school board is so important because you're dealing with the future of America. Um, certain textbooks may only highlight one page talking about slavery, while the rest of the pages in the civic classes, the history AP classes are talking about an agenda because it's an institution of um, what George Jefferson, uh, George, uh, George Washington, George Washington did, Thomas Jefferson, um, John Adams, Patrick Henry, the Boston Tea Party, which is one of my favorite stories. Um, it actually correlates to what's going on now. That wasn't a peaceful movement. With the Boston Tea Party, people getting shot. Uh, right. It was a rebellion. Yeah. And this country was founded on treason and rebellion to, to the crown. Totally. Um, so it's one of those things where it's like, if, if we're not even understanding what the five basic things of a community are and controlling that, you know, it... it to me, that's how I answer your question of institutional racism. So, I mean, there's there's so much there. Obviously, those those five factors are are so key. I'm just I'm just thinking out loud here. I mean, how do we get to the point of starting to mend those five factors to be able to like really pull community together? Is, is there a way to to do this? There is a way. It's not popular. Going back there, it's not sexy. Uh, being very blunt with you, and I may get some some lashes from black folks, is that um, this it's a whole lot of singing and dancing going on. <laughs> 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 Entertainers are being pushed as our role models, and and the microphone is saying, "Hey, you know, tell us what you think about uh, a subject you have no idea about." Um, so. What I mean by that is you have to talk to the talking heads in terms of the people that are actually doing the work. Um, so, for instance, there has to be a serious conversation about, um, I'll say, uh, there's a poet that came out with a song. His name is Spenzo. Um, I'm sorry, his name's Day Day. <laughs> and Day Day said... Maybe about five or ten years ago, he had a song that was really on the airwaves. It was called Spend It. It was the lyrics go, spend that, spend that check and make it right back. And everybody, I'm, I'm at the I'm at the party, the, the senior week at Morehouse, and everybody's dancing and throwing money in the air. And I said, well, what if we don't make it back? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, case in point, COVID-19. What what if yeah. restaurants, prominent restaurants in, in the white community, black community, uh, Hispanic community, Asian community, they got hit really hard. Uh, what if you don't make it back? What if it, it leads to a filing of a chapter 7 or 13 bankruptcy? Uh, reorganization of your debts. Um, you know, I've I, Talk to those that are listening and say, mm -mm. we have to seriously consider the paycheck you bring home. You have to look in the mirror and say, what if I don't make it back? So the challenge should be 20 to 60 percent of what you take home net income should be going towards a drip. Something that is dripping out cash flow. Um, and as yeah. for me, I'm 31. Um, there's nothing that gets me more excited than advanced insurance concepts, uh, which 
you know, is, uh, is I, I call it CVLI, uh, cash value life insurance. So these conversations uh, must be had because it has to be a way of you know, how can we get out of our situation without a handout? Because I don't know if reparations are coming. Um, I don't know if certain people's jobs mm-hmm. are coming back. And I have told members of Bro Capital that who are mainly, of course, millennials, 20s, early 30s, is that we must get to a point where we find out how to take 20 to 60 percent and put it into um, whether an investment vehicle or savings vehicle that is going to carry us into our 40s. Where we say, you know what? I got a lot of respect for the greatest generation in the world, the baby boomers, followed by Generation X. But I'm not excited about working in my 50s or my 60s. Right on. (laughs) I want to be at work optional mode slash retirement outside of certain roller coaster financial strategies. (laughs) (laughs) Within my early 40s. Um, and for some people, you know, it they may look at look up and they in their 40s and say, you know what, BT was right. But they didn't do it. Uh, yeah. They got too caught up in what they needed now, the short term. Um, but I'm all about you know, looking at that, that ant colony saying, I got to build a storehouse, a warehouse, because one day... I don't want to work. I want to spend time with my family. I want to be able to buy things without having to tell somebody, well, no, not right now. Cause I, I still have to put in some work. Um, so that's, that's just a high level of, of what can be done. And, you know, if you want to follow up with another question, you know, I'll, I'll be more than obliged to to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. 
Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can. In the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member FDIC. It's Tuesday, and we have another Ask Shauna, and this one comes from Joel. Joel says, Hello, I'm 20 years old, and I'm not finished with college. I also still live with my parents, and I'm not financially independent. What books do you recommend I read to become financially independent sooner? Also, what tips do you have for parents that are controlling with money and how to get around it? Joel, <laughs> these are great questions. Wow. Um, let's start with the easier one, okay? I've got a ton of great book recommendations. Many of them are previous guests. Actually, all of them are previous guests that have been on the show. So if one of these books really resonates with you, not only pick it up, but also check out the podcast episode and listen to the important message. I am going to, in the show notes, not only link these books, I'm going to link 10 of my favorites, but I'm also going to link the podcast interview where this person was on. <laughs> so if you're looking for that information, you don't have to remember it, just go to the show notes. So the first is The Wealthy Gardener by John Seforic. He was just recently on the podcast and that book is really a book that you keep on your bedside table and you read over and over. There are so many gems in there about becoming financially independent. The second is called The Money Tree by Chris Gillibo, and Chris was also recently on the show. He's written a couple of books that I absolutely love. He's got one called The $100 Startup. If anybody is listening, they want to start a business, I would definitely recommend picking up that book. But The Money Tree is just a really interesting way to learn about money through a story. Both The Money Tree and The Wealthy Gardener are great books to pick up. The next one is called Work Your Money, Not Your Life by my friend Roger Ma, who is a certified financial planner himself. And this is just a great book to really get you focused on what life do you want to create and then how do you get your money to come around that life. The next one is called Passive Income Aggressive Retirement by Rachel Richards. She had actually one of our top episodes this year, and she's just brilliant at creating passive income. I think passive income is one of the best things when I talk to you on the show about buckets of money, buckets of wealth, however you want to call it. This is how wealthy people get wealthy, right? They don't just have money in a 401k or in a savings account. They have money in lots of different places. So this is a great one to pick up. Happy Money by Ken Honda, also a staple for your bedside table. Just a great book to help you frame how you're thinking about money. Same with Holistic Wealth by Keisha Blair. Those two just great books to have and keep on your bookshelf. And then a couple of investing books, Plant Your Money Tree by Michelle Snyder. We've had Mish on the show several times, and this is one of my very favorite investing books because it kind of takes away, I should say, everything that maybe you thought about investing and boils it down into a just a really easy way to think about investing, particularly outside of your 401k or your IRA. So that's a great book. Also, Invested by Danielle Town. She's one of my friends. This is a New York Times bestseller book. This is a great book to pick up if you want to invest, again, outside of 401k, our IRA, and you want to have a great story, someone who knew nothing about investing to start. Well, she knew about investing, but she didn't have any investing experience until she started this practice that she details in her book. Two other great books to pick up, one called Franklin Fi by Shane Dillon, great book about financial independence, and Broke Millennial by Aaron Lowry. That is my top 10 of books. I think anybody listening wants to have just a great library and well-rounded books to read. These are like no fluff, so many lessons you can pick out of these books, so those would be my favorites. Now, as far as your parents go... <laughs> That is a tough one for sure. And 
I don't have the exact right answer. I have worked with many people in very similar experiences that you're in right now. One question I just want to ask is, have you had a conversation with them about money and really sharing your thoughts? Have this open conversation? Probably the answer is no, and that's okay. But I have found that controlling usually comes about because parents aren't sure that you know (laughs) what to do with your money. And this is the same in relationships too, right? Controlling comes out when someone feels out of control and they feel like maybe you don't know how to do things best. And since we don't openly talk about money, there's like this fog that stays around. So I know it's tough, but I would consider talking to them about how you feel. Here are just some conversation openers, if you will. Maybe ask them, I want to know about your money story. Like, what do you think is the biggest money lessons you've learned and how can I avoid them myself? Or what do you think are some of the traits of someone who is really financially secure? Is there anything related to money that you still want to learn about? What steps do you think I should take to become more financially responsible? This is a big one because whatever they tell you back, that is basically a reflection maybe of why they're controlling, right? Maybe they just don't see you interested in money. And then you could also just ask them, hey, what are your general feelings about money? This doesn't have to be a a big ordeal conversation, maybe while you're cooking dinner or hanging out with them. Just have a conversation, really a no-judgment zone. Tell your parents that that you've been learning about money and you want to become financially independent. And sometimes just the simple act of voicing it really helps things move forward. So I would really encourage you just grab some of those books, have a conversation, even if it's scary and a little rocky at first, just tiptoe your way into it right? But Joel, you're headed in the right direction. And I know you're going to get there. If you're listening and you haven't asked Sean a question, I want to hear it. If you want to remain anonymous, that's totally cool with me. Just go to the website on the homepage. There is a questionnaire you can fill out for Ask Shauna or go to the link in the show notes. It's as easy as that. No, I I love it. I mean, you're you're a man of of many talents. Uh, You've seen a lot. You've you've worked in a lot of places, which I think is really great. Like it gives you this really well rounded perspective. Uh, I want to come back to cash value life insurance because we actually haven't talked about that very much on the show. But Uh I have just uh oh okay. I know, I know. (laughs) I have just a a quick question for you. Like, you you said you also worked uh, in the White House in politics a little bit, like, can you, can you give me any, um, you know, quote unquote, like insider, uh, insider feedback? Like are, are things inside, inside the white house, inside politics, are they as crazy on the inside as they seem to us out here on the outside? It's even crazier on the inside. Um, it's Mm. one of those, even what you see in the media is, is dumbed down because the public can't handle the truth. They can't handle that there's uh, influential directors that are having sexual relationships <laughs> um, with people that are not their significant other. Hmm. Um, no, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know. You know. For instance, I worked for a congressman. Alcee Hastings, he represents the great state of Florida, um, West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale. And a lot of people don't even know that he used to be a federal judge. Federal judge, you get um, appointed, that is a lifetime position. Yes. Well, apparently, Alcee was taking bribes for shortening sentences uh, for certain individuals that could pay. Um, So he was actually impeached as a federal judge. He was removed. And the the beauty of America was that he got elected as a congressman. (laughs) (laughs) There's there's something very wrong with that statement. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember asking him when uh, I was working with him, he said, hey, you know what, BT, um, 
you know, anytime you need something, you can always call. And I said, man, it's just one question I got to ask. Off the record, you know, there's no need for me to even say anything about it. I said, man, did you take the money? He said, I'm going to tell you like I told everybody else. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> that answer is no. Now, when it comes to the White House, I worked in the office, executive office of the president, specifically uh, the Office of Presidential Correspondence. So, little known fact about, I worked under President Obama. Um, and little known fact about that specific office, presidential correspondence, is that people are constantly writing the president, his family, uh, and the second family about things, issues, and concerns and developments that they have going on in their lives. And if the story is touching enough in terms of like they're behind on rent, utilities, they don't know where they're going to get their next meal. So many people look in America that are hurting. And you know, I had the pleasure of recommending them to what I call AL. I would write that on the letter that was sent in. And that means we're, we're prioritizing this family to go to agency liaison. Agency liaison would work the back channel on taking care of the families that wrote in. Wow. Yes. I never knew that. That's amazing. It's not sexy. So it the media doesn't sexy. talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, that was, um, that was the thing I really enjoyed. Um, uh, got to meet a lot of folks. Um, uh, I also worked for uh, the presidential re-election in 2012, the headquarters in Chicago off of Randolph. And that was really crazy uh, in the headquarters. I mean, I'm watching just top level officials cussing each other out, throwing things. <laughs> um, but it was all to figure out, can we win? <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, right. And what really, what I, what I noticed about it, so I'm, I'm now talking about my transition to finance and insurance advanced concepts, is that when things went wrong, circling back, there was the police officer, there was a member of the clergy, there was a politician. And these are the people that usually got in front of the mic on the uh, media outlets. So when it was time to pick a major at Morehouse, I said, well, you got to pick something. I said, I don't know, uh, political science. Because <laughs> <laughs> at my dinner table, certain things weren't discussed. Money wasn't discussed. Right. I know that's one of the questions that uh, we had talked offline about. And it was one of those, don't, don't say nothing about it. And as I got older, I said, man, I can't believe nobody at the dinner table told me that I should have been majoring in some form of business. Totally. Specifically finance for me. Um, because I strongly believe that your need for finance is greater than your death benefit. Anything that you have out here. Um, because it's going to cost more to keep you alive than to donate your body to science. You are so right on. Yes. When when the election ended, uh, President Obama won his second term. A lot of folks were, oh, I'm going back to D.C. And, and they said, well, you coming? I said, no, I'm, I'm getting ready to get, get involved in this master of public policy, uh, which really uh, talked about the inner workings of nonprofit, for-profit communities and I also wanted to get involved in advocacy and lobbying. They had a, a course there where we would go down to Springfield, Illinois, and uh, actually interact with police officers, um, legislators, as well as in Chicago. Uh, I was actually influential. I don't like to toot my own horn, but I'll do it now. Uh, Marcus Evans, 33rd District State Representative in Illinois. That's on the south side of Chicago. He wasn't for concealed carry. Uh, but after I, 
I was uh, schooled under the tutelage uh, of my professor at DePaul. Uh, we actually presented hard data as to how this is actually going to come back. Um, going back to that term neighborhood, how can we come up with resources to make it a community? Illinois was the last state to pass concealed carry to my own. Thanks to me, my state rep actually changed his mind and voted yay. So, um, wow. but I still had a yearning to say, how can we get this to a community? And that's when I went and said, I have to get involved in insurance and finance. And, you know, here I am now with Bro Capital. Yeah, right? I love that message. Yeah, tell me a little bit about, like, I know Bro Capital, you you guys are the first fintech company where you're really focused on financial health of Black millennials with something you call social banking. Like, tell me a little bit about what what is the power of social banking? Sure, the, the power of social banking is is key, especially in the the black neighborhood. I still won't call it a community. <laughs> we're, not <laughs> like, we're not there we're yet. We're not there yet. Um, it's it's a an, an old story about someone that has been inspired by someone famous that's wealthy, such as Robert F. Smith. They paid off all of the college. Uh, yes, student loan yes. debt for Morehouse College last year in 2019 they'll say man that was great I love what he did and one day you know what I'm going to get around to, to managing my money I'm going to get around to 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 actually saving some money and and they look up and however much they made in two weeks at their job majority of it may be gone so it also reminds you of if someone tells you, man, I, I can't join Bro Capital because y'all charging too much. The onboarding fees are uh, somewhere. Uh, we're actually reworking the numbers now, but it was at one point uh, $399, $399 for the onboarding fee yeah. uh, along with $50 biweekly contributions and it goes into the bro savings fund and we'll talk to millennials that are say oh man y'all charging way too much i can't do that and i said well wait a minute hold on hold on you 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 got a got a girlfriend that you really want to spend the rest of your life with right <laughs> yeah yeah i love her and i want to take care of her. i said well, okay let's let's do a rundown you got paid on friday um she said she wanted to go see a new movie. She said she wanted to go out to eat. That may lead to some ice cream. And <laughs> I said, <laughs> before yeah, I said, you know before it, you know it, if you look at your, your banking app, you spent somewhere over a hundred dollars in one night. Easily. Easily. And, you know, I, I'll say simple things like that because it, it'll bring it home. Yeah, you're right. Things that, you you blow money on it, you'll never see again. And one thing that I, I really like about um, uh, that concept when I'm talking to black male millennials is that I said the significant other, uh, she'll be at the, the dinner table, she'll be at the movie theater, she'll be at the, the ice cream parlor. The beauty about her is that most likely she never pulled out her pocketbook. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I said, she's kind of smart here. Exactly. I said, chivalry is not dead. It's just on <laughs> life support. Right. <laughs> I said, so that's another demographic we're going to target next: black women. Yeah. Um, because they, I strongly believe they have more uh, economic, financial, economic sense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when it comes to saving, investing, banking. Um. But going back to the black male millennial is that that you you can't tell me that you can't get involved in this concept when you're constantly pouring money into other institutions that are not run by black male millennials. And I said, yeah. it goes yeah. back to, do you want to be in a neighborhood where you don't run and control resources or do you want to be in a community where 
social banking with Bro Capital, uh, the collective, we have shareholders. This is a cooperative um, financial technology um, firm where we, we strongly believe on, you know, this isn't, hey, the founders run everything. I'm not a founder. Roz is. B Dub, Brian Williams, as well as DQ Darius Quarles. Uh, those are the founders. Uh, but they welcome me with open arms to uh you know run the uh, the investment relations as well as the accounting and accountability. Yeah. So um that's that's how I, I answer that question is you know when you hear about people saying that they can't get involved with social banking, I'll say you can't tell me that because let me run down what you did on Friday. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that message. I mean, I I talk about that a lot. It's just the awareness of of knowing where your money's going. Right. We we've talked about so much, BT. I'm just I'm just curious. Uh, so, what advice? I mean, obviously, you talk about this this idea of building. I call it buckets of money, buckets of wealth. Um, you, you have sort of the similar language, right? Like we have to create these, these opportunities for cash flow for us. So tell me a little bit, um, as we wrap up, like if, if you could leave someone particularly, you know, African-American male, African-American female, that are listening right now. What are a couple of things that they can really focus on to, to grow their money exponentially in that way? Uh, so that they can start having that that feeling of community. Sure. Um, they want to get involved in legally binding agreements known as a contract. Um, that that with that contract, it involves a guarantee. And I must say I'm not an attorney, <laughs> but I can read. And that's what it says in a contract, specific certain contracts. And more importantly, if you look at um, what is sexy, uh, as I call it, the roller coaster, there's, there's certain markets that will say in their prospectus that we can't guarantee you anything, but we look forward to having you. Right. <laughs> you can come on in. Come though. on in, because that's what the media is beating on that drum. I'm more concerned as to my last, if I can say anything to the listeners, is that we must look at what some of the heavy hitters have done. There's a guy named Walt Disney. Know him well, yes. You know him well, okay. I'm so happy that his parks are getting ready to open, and there's rumors the NBA is going to play out this season there. Yes. (laughs) Well, Walt Disney, a little known fact is that in 1953, to help fund Disneyland uh, when no traditional banker would lend him financial capital. He actually borrowed from his his uh, policy contract in the form of a loan, which I call CVLI, Cash Value Life Insurance. And look at him now. Disney owns ABC, ESPN, and the list goes on. Um, there's another guy named James Cash Penny. You may know him as J.C. Penny. Yes. 1929, the stock market. We hear a lot about that. He actually borrowed against his CVLI policy loans um, to help meet company payroll and operations on a day-to-day basis. There's another guy named John McCain, famous senator, famous prisoner of war in the Vietnam War. Um, in 2008, in the early stages of the GOP nomination process, it was a large pool of candidates. His campaign was actually running on low, mon- uh, low money uh, where they couldn't pay all the staffers. He went to a bank, and because of his age, they said, well, we don't know if you're going to be around. So what he did, he said, I'll come back as collateral with a CVLI because if I pass away then you'll get that death benefit so you're going to get your money right. it's a guarantee um, and these all three 
famous people use this form to start, grow, and finance their businesses. Um, yeah. So I become a firm believer in it. You know, I'll also say to people that have families, when my, 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 my oldest kid is eight, but I've already told them that, uh, let's say for my daughter, um, if she approaches me and says, you know what, you know, I, I got proposed to, I want to get married to such and such, I'll pull this gentleman to the side and say, congratulations. Okay, now you got to do one thing for me. I want you to fill out this insurance application. Because if we're talking about generational, generational financial capital, we're talking about a different form of family banking in CVLI. Um, I need to know that you're responsible. I also need to know that you're going to take care of folks no matter what. Um, I would tell them that I've grown accustomed to using this form, not only myself, my wife, my four children, um, but it has so many different benefits. When I talked about retirement, work optional, that's what I'm going to be using <laughs> as yeah. forms of continuing to fund my way of life. Um, and, you know, Roz understands that. He has a policy. So does the other three founders. And my goal is to go after, there's a guy named W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm. And he talked about the talented tip. My goal is to, if I can target 10% of the black neighborhood, because we're still working on community. <laughs> <laughs> then I've reached my goal in saying you need to understand that your need for finance is greater than your death benefit. And this is a form that is guaranteed of all of the noise that is out there. Um, and it can also fund the noise. If you want to fund real estate, if you want to fund going after certain markets, um, it can fund that. So, yeah, you know, that's that's one of the things that we, we're working on now is saying it'll be malpractice for Bro Capital to have members and you're not prepared for living or death. I cannot stand the the new form of passing of the hat which is the GoFundMe account when someone passes away. Yeah, right. Um, and I'm a firm believer. Don't ask me because you ain't getting it. Because if I've had a conversation with you <laughs> and you, you, nah, I get to it, then don't ask me to uh, drop a bucket in that GoFundMe account. So, you know, I don't want to take up a lot of your time, but that's that's what I believe with your your listeners is that Really take a second look at another form of um, guarantee, and that's important, especially in times like post-COVID-19 with such uncertainty. Um, you need something that's guaranteed in your life to really be accountable to your family and one day to a budding community. <laughs> So what do you say? Let's let's end racism, right? Let's make money accessible to everyone. Let's just level the playing field. Why don't we just do that? I hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Roz and Brian. They are so awesome. If you want to connect with them, head on over to their website, Bro Capital. Bro is spelled B-R-E-A-U-X capital.com. I know they would love to hear from you. As always on this podcast, we're changing our language around money once and for all so that you can live the life you want to live. Now that you're a part of this movement, it's up to all of us to invite others in. So share this episode with someone that you know needs to hear this message. 
and vitamins so we can all talk about money in a new, fun, and fresh way. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode.